Welcome back to Teaching Women to Teach. In our previous lesson, we heard from Dr. Mark Futado. He spoke to us about genre and why understanding the genre of a particular passage in the Bible provides us both a reading strategy and a context for understanding the meaning of a text. In the next two lessons, we are going to hear from an Old Testament professor and then a New Testament professor about redemptive history and specifically the covenantal framework of the Bible. In this lesson, you're going to be hearing from Dr. Nicholas Reed. He's an Old Testament professor here at RTS Orlando, and he'll be speaking on redemptive history, the covenantal framework of the Old Testament. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And I pray that you would help us to see how Christ has fulfilled uh, the precept, uh, the penalty, and earn the right for the promise of life in your kingdom. So, Lord, I pray of all things that you would help us to see Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make per perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. In recent years, there have been some attempts to live biblically for a period of time or for a year. And usually these projects are done on social media or some sort of platform. And the intention is, is to take the Bible as literally as possible. And typically the idea is that you would uh, apply it literally and therefore expose the inconsistencies with which Christians apply the biblical text to their lives. The underlying assumption is, is that we're all picking and choosing at the end of the day. And so they want to expose that inconsistency by reading the Bible and applying everything in it quite literally. Uh, the idea is, is that even the more absurd, the better. And so it suggests that Christians are being inconsistent uh, in their approach to the Bible. These overall parodies of Christian interpretation, however, are straw men uh, arguments at best or critiques at best, and I think downright dishonest at worst, since they demonstrate a general lack of awareness not only of the principles of interpretation and genre, which you've been studying over the last two weeks, um, but they also fail to grasp the progression of redemptive history, which is our task tonight, to discuss redemptive history. In fact, we attempt to model our interpretation of the Bible after an application of it, after the pattern found in the Bible itself. And that's why I want to spend a lot of time looking at the biblical text with you. We're going to read a lot of scripture today because we're trying to draw our hermeneutic or our interpretation of the Bible from the biblical text itself. And that helps us to understand the movement from shadow to reality, from unclean foods to clean foods. From circumcision to baptism, from Passover to the Lord's Supper, from worship through the blood of bulls and goats to the once and for all sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paying attention to redemptive history and the overall covenantal structure of the Bible helps you to read, understand, and faithfully apply the Word of God to your life. So tonight we're going to be talking about redemptive history. Redemptive history is quite simply the history of of redemption. I know it's quite simply, it, it, it's, it's no rocket science. It's the history or the progress of redemption. And that history of redemption takes a covenantal shape. And so we're going to be talking about covenant theology. A covenant theology is about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Covenant theology helps us to understand fundamental truths about the Bible. If there is only one way of salvation, Jesus says no one comes to the Father except through him. If there is only one way of salvation, then we know that Abraham, Moses, Daniel, Joseph, 
and many others were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. They looked forward to his coming. Jesus says, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. In fact, Paul in Romans chapter 4 uses Abraham to demonstrate that justification or being declared right with God is by faith and not by works. We're going to be looking at Romans 4 a little bit later tonight. He also cites David in Psalm 32 to argue from the Old Testament and explain the gospel to the church at Rome. This means that there is fundamental continuity in the one way of salvation. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. There is only one gospel. So there's fundamental continuity in Scripture, and that continuity is found in Jesus Christ himself. Now, our covenant theology also helps us to understand the diverse ways by which this one way of salvation in Jesus Christ is held forth to the people of God. If Abraham was justified by faith, then why does he worship God, or why did he worship God differently than you do? Why did Moses, if he was saved by faith, looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, why did he have to worship God through the sacrifice of the blood of, and, of, of bulls and of goats? Or to put it differently, when you drive to church on Sunday, why don't you load up some goats and some lambs in your suburban? Why do you go on Sunday and not Saturday? Why do you get to worship God in spirit and in truth? instead of making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And other than it just being downright delicious, why do you get to eat bacon or shrimp or shrimp wrapped in bacon? <laughs> Covenant theology provides an answer to the diverse ways in which this one way of salvation has been held forth to the people of God throughout redemptive history. Put differently, covenant theology helps us to see how the worship of the one way of salvation moves from shadow to reality, from promise to fulfillment. So what is covenant theology then? Well, theology, first of all, as Scott Swain will tell you, my boss, so a little kudos there, a little shout out to Scott Swain. Um, he will tell you that theology is the study of God and all things in relation to God. Quite simply, that's the task of theology. We're studying God and all things in relation to God. And covenant is the formal means by which God relates to his creatures and he administers his kingdom. Covenant is the formal means by which God relates to his creatures and administers his kingdom. Now, there are different covenants found in Scripture. We're going to be focusing primarily on the two redemptive covenants or the two covenants found in redemptive history. Uh, but I want to begin by just talking to you about some of the other examples of covenants, because covenants in the ancient Near East were just a part of life. Now, we don't talk a whole lot about covenants typically in our community, but we, we know them in our, in our, in our, um, in our day, day to day lives. For example, marriage is a covenant. You are embarking on a new relationship with certain terms for sicker or for poor, forsaking all others, for better or for worse, till death do us part. You're, you're setting the terms of a new relationship with someone. Marriage is a covenant. Um, the very fact that you live in a, um, maybe you live in an HOA, and you're really glad that your neighbor doesn't get to sort of park broken down vehicles for 10 years in their front yard and have the grass grow up over them. That's a covenant. You're living in a community. To belong to that community, there are certain obligations. There are certain requirements um, that you have to fulfill and certain behaviors you have to avoid in order to enjoy being a part of that community. Another one we can think about in our culture is international treaties or alliances. If Britain, goes, if Britain is attacked, we go to war. And that's a covenant, essentially. We have an alliance with one another. Well, there are also other examples of covenants in Scripture. Uh, you'll remember uh, the Gibeonites in Joshua chapter 9. There's an international treaty. They, they got their crusty bread, their moldy bread out, and they got their, their ruined sandals. And they said, oh, we've traveled so far to meet you. We heard about your God. Let's make a covenant. And they deceived Joshua by pretending like they had traveled for a distance. Joshua makes a covenant with them. He only subsequently realizes that they're actually neighbors, and, but it was too late. Joshua and the Israelites had to honor that agreement. And when the Gibeonites are attacked by the neighboring uh, countries or the neighboring city-states, 
the Israelites had to go to war to fight for the Gibeonites. There are clan or tribal alliances found in Scripture. Uh, you remember when uh, Abram had to go and save, um, uh, save, like you know his name, Abram had to go save Lot. And um, so he, he had been taken by a group of, of alli- alliances or, or groups of clans, confederates that were together, and he had to go and save Lot. Uh, there are personal and loyalty agreements. You remember when um, David and Jonathan make a covenant together. That's a covenant of personal loyalty with one another. Marriage is a covenant found in Scripture, as well as national legal agreements. Now, when we're looking for covenants in Scripture, it's not just that the word is present that's important. It's the elements of, co- of a covenant that is most important. So the, the Hebrew word for covenant, berit, and the, the Greek word for covenant, diatheke, um, it's helpful if they're present, but it's not necessary for them to be present for actual covenant to be in view within the text. Now, we know this based on 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 7 never uses the term covenant when referring to the agreement that God is making with David. But when Psalm 89 reflects on this passage, he refers to it, that, that text refers to it as a covenant. We see the same thing with marriage. Marriage, when it's given in Genesis chapter 2, the word covenant doesn't appear anywhere in that context. But it is referred to as a covenant in Malachi chapter 2. And so that's simply to put, um, to emphasize the point that what matters is not so much the terminology being present, it's the elements of a covenant. And these elements can be present in minimal or expansive forms. In minimal forms, we have the elements of a covenant in Genesis chapter 2. We'll be returning to this later. But you have promised blessings, stipulations, and also sanctions in Genesis chapter 2. Covenants are also present, though, in more expansive forms. The entire book of Deuteronomy. Some of you are going to be coming to Deuteronomy pretty soon, and you're reading through the Bible in a year plan. And uh, you're just hoping you make it through Leviticus this year, right? Right? And then you got to go through Numbers. But you might make it to Deuteronomy if you're, like, super righteous this year. And, um, but Deuteronomy is an entire covenantal document. It's one big covenant. You've got a name of the king, a history of benevolence. You've got stipulations and promised blessings and sanctions or curses and provisions for transmitting the covenant. So covenants in the Bible are present in minimal form and also expansive form. And when we talk about covenant theology, we talk about a three structural covenant, three structural covenants. The first is the covenant of redemption. This is also called the pactum salutis. And so you can impress your husbands and friends when you go home tonight. And we were just just chatting about the pactum salutis and uh, act like, you know, it's a big deal. Um, But as described by Scott Swain, see there, another shout out to my boss, uh, the eternal appointment of the Son of God by way of covenant to become the incarnate redeemer and head of his adopted siblings. Now, since our focus tonight is on redemptive history, as structured by covenant theology, we will not spend time discussing the eternal covenant of redemption within the Godhead. We will devote our attention to the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. So our focus tonight is on two covenants, the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. This is the two Adamic structure of the Bible. You are in Christ or you're in Adam. There's no middle ground. You are in Christ, or you are in Adam. And so I want to begin by looking at Romans chapter 5, 12 through 21. This is where we get, this is one of the key passages where we get our two covenant structure of redemptive history. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even though over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. So a few things going on there. Sin enters into the world, and death comes with sin through Adam. And Adam is a type of the one who was to come, a type of Christ, in other words. But the free gift is not like the trespass. So there's a comparison, but there's a difference. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift 
by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespasses death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. In fact, I think Paul's inviting you here to think for a moment about all of the ways in which your life is touched by the fall. All of the corruption, all of the death, all of the decay, all of the frustration, your divided hearts, everything that you experience because of the fall. And he's, he wants you to think about that and then realize that the abundant life you have in Christ Jesus awaiting you in glory is so much more. It's that much greater. How much more? Therefore, as one trespass, he continues verse 18, led to condemnation for all men. So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's, disobe so, so, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, Scripture is organized under a two-atom structure. In Christ, in Adam. The first Adam and the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it represents the two overarching covenants under which all human beings belong. And it helps us to understand the, the, the structure or the movement throughout Scripture. You have creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. And this is understood through the two Adam structures of Scripture. So if you're in Adam, then you're under a covenant of works. You must earn the blessing of life. But you were guilty because of Adam's sin and because of your own sin, which was like Adam's. Even though they're different, it falls under the same category of condemnation. And you're at enmity with God. Everyone fell in Adam and stands condemned. That's why... In the New Testament, for example, life is still held out through obedience. It's an impossibility, but whenever someone says, I want to be made right with God by what I do, or I want to add to the justification of Christ, I want to add something to that, then Paul or Jesus will hold forth and say, okay, here's the law. You have to keep every last bit of it. And so the law there stands only to condemn you. In that situation, because you cannot do anything to earn your salvation. Because you are fallen, you sinned in Adam as your head, and also you sin like Adam, the possibility of life through obedience um, is, is, is non existent anymore. So that's in Adam or the covenant of works. The other option, the other covenant, is you have a mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who bears your sin and credits his righteousness to your account. This is called the covenant of grace. So let's start with the covenant of works in Adam. The Westminster Confession of Faith 7.2 describes it like this. The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam, and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. Now, remember earlier we talked about how covenants are present in minimal and expansive form. The elements of the covenant here are minimal. You have a precept offered. The precept is found in Genesis chapter 2, 16 and 17. Genesis chapter 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. You may eat of every tree of the garden. Think about it for a moment. In an orchard, in a garden, in an orchard, surrounded by fruit trees. And all of this good food. And you can have all of it. You may eat of all of the trees, except for one. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now remember, the primordial lie is, is that God is withholding something good from his people. 
Right? That's the idea. Did God really say you may not eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden? That's what the serpent says in chapter 3. And really, if you think about it, that's the lie that we all believe in our temptation, isn't it? Is that belief that deep down inside, we think God is withholding something good from us. We think that God is miserly. We think that God is not good. And that's what they go through. She saw that it was good for food. It was a delight to, uh, to the eyes and desirable to make one wise. And so she took of the fruit and ate. And she gave some to the man who was with her, and he ate. So there's the precept. You may not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's also the promise. If the penalty is death, then the promise then must be life. But it's also inherent in the text. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, we're told the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In chapter 3, verse 22, we're also told that there was the tree of life, uh, that, or chapter 23, uh, 22, and then again in 24, the tree of life is mentioned. Behold, now the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. The tree of life in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3, and also all the way in Revelation chapter 22 symbolizes communion with God, enjoyment of life in God's presence. Okay? And this movement, it's important to remember, we'll come back to this, but it's important to remember they're barred from the tree of life, but it reappears in Revelation 22. We're given access through the lamb that was slain. Okay? So there's the promise of life. And then the, finally, there's the penalty. On the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Dying you will die is a way of translating the Hebrew. It's kind of clunky, but it gets just the idea across. Now, although there are passages such as Hebrew, uh, Hosea 6-7, which, um, uh, which uh, very well could be referring to the uh, Adamic covenant here being mentioned, uh, it's important to understand that the development of the doctrine of the covenant of works was never based upon simple proof text, like a, a single verse here or there. The development of this doctrine was from biblical and theological exegesis on passages such as 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the, the passage you know of because of the resurrection. It's also based upon passages like Romans chapter 5, which we read earlier, and even Acts chapter, chapter 17. Entire books like the, uh, Galatians, for example, uh, help us get at this doctrine. So as Richard Muller said, historically, the covenant of works was never based upon bad proof texting. Rather, it was a consequence of biblical theological exegesis, not only of Genesis chapter 2, but also of Romans, Galatians, etc. So although sometimes the covenant of works as a doctrine is criticized, it's never been about bad proof texting or just trying to, to impose a structure over the Bible. What we're doing is we're trying to understand how the Bible talks about itself and then articulate that in our theology and then apply that in our reading of Scripture. And so what about the covenant of works and the work of Christ? Romans 5, 12 through 21 interprets Adam's transgression and death, the Mosaic precept and penalty, and Christ's obedience and reward under one overarching covenantal legal context. In other words, Christ fulfilled the precept of the covenant of works. This is called his act of obedience. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He fulfilled the law perfectly. He came under the law and he fulfilled it perfectly. Jesus Christ fulfilled the precept. This is called the active obedience of Christ. Christ also fulfilled the penalty of the covenant of works. This is called the passive obedience of Christ. This is where he takes the penalty that you and I deserve because of our sin. So he perfectly fulfills the law, and yet he takes the penalty upon himself. So his active and his passive obedience is important for us to understand because it communicates to us our salvation. Because he did these two things, he also won the right to the promise. He fulfilled the precept, he bore the penalty, and he won the right to the promise of the covenant of works. Christ won your right to glory. 
It pleased God to offer you life in Christ by grace through faith. Jesus won the reward. He won the promise of life in communion with God. And that's why the tree of life appears again in Revelation chapter 22. Wilhelmus of Breckel says this, Acquaintance with this covenant is of the greatest importance. Whoever errs here or denies the existence of the covenant of works will not understand the covenant of grace and will readily err concerning the mediatorship of the Lord Jesus. Such a person will very readily deny that Christ, by his act of obedience, has merited a right to eternal life for the elect. This is to be observed with several parties who, because they err concerning the covenant of grace, also deny the covenant of works. Conversely, whoever denies the covenant of works must rightly be suspected to be an error concerning the covenant of grace as well. Now, I wouldn't state it so strongly, um, but I think it's important to reflect upon. What he's getting at is the covenant of works help, helps us to understand the active and passive obedience of Christ. And that then helps you understand what it means to be under grace. Jesus Christ fulfilled the covenant of works that you might enjoy life in the covenant of grace. You're no longer under law. You're in the gospel. You're in Christ. And so that brings us then to the covenant of grace or in Christ. This is the covenant where you receive the benefits of Christ's perfect life and sacrifice by grace through faith in him. Again, the Westminster Confession says this, Man by his fall, having made himself incapable of life by that covenant, the Lord was pleased to make a second, commonly called the covenant of grace, wherein he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit, to make them willing and able to believe. Again, Christ fulfilled the precept, paid the penalty, and earned the promise of the covenant of works that you might receive the benefits of his redemption by grace through faith. Simply put, no one was ever saved outside of Jesus Christ. Now, some of you, when you think of covenant of works, covenant of grace, you're going to be tempted to think that covenant of works, Old Testament, covenant of grace, New Testament. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about covenant of works is life through obedience. And that covenant never ended. It exists to this day. And all it can do for you is condemn you if you're outside of Christ. And then there's the covenant of grace. Christ fulfilled the covenant of works in order that people might be saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That is the covenant of grace. When you think about the covenant of grace, here's what I want you to hear. When you think about the covenant of grace, what is at the heart of it? At the heart of it is the covenant formula. I will be your God and you'll be my people. J.F. Packer says that Christianity is a matter of personal pronouns. I will be your God. You will be my people. That's the lifeblood of covenant theology. That's the heartbeat of the covenant of grace. What does it mean to belong to God? What does it mean to belong to God? I mean, we all want to belong. We want to belong with friends. We want to belong with groups. We, you know, we join things. We want to belong in families. We want to belong in churches or whatever it is. We all have places. We want to belong. What does it mean to belong to God? What does it mean for God to belong to you? I will be your God. You will be my people. Christianity is a matter of personal pronouns. And this is true in the Old and the New Testament. This fundamental promise, the hope of it and the obligations of it, is essentially the same throughout redemptive history. Leviticus 26, verse 12. And I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. 
2 Corinthians 6, 16 through 18. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst, and be separate for them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. The sum and substance of covenant theology, of the covenant of grace in the Old and New Testaments, is belonging to God and His family. You belong. I will be your God, and you will be my people. You have all the rights and the responsibilities attached to that. Sometimes I've, I've illustrated this with my children. You know, we used to say stuff, stuff like, you know, reeds don't quit, right? Reeds don't quit, right? Because you're a reed. Now, if you ever quit, do you cease to be a reed? No, of course not, right? But there's a certain expectation in my family. You know, because you belong to my family, there are certain expectations attached to that. Right? There are rights and privileges, but there are also certain expectations. Now, if you struggle with that, you don't cease to be my family. You're already in my family. But there's a certain expectation placed upon you by virtue of that relationship. That's what we're thinking about with covenant theology. I will be your God, and you'll be my people. What does it mean to belong to God and Him to have a claim upon your life? What does it mean to be owned by God in the sense that He created you, but also He redeemed you, He bought you, with a precious price, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What are the rights and the responsibilities of belonging to God? So there is fundamental and essential continuity in the way by which sinners are brought into the family of God. And I want to illustrate this to you with a passage I referenced earlier with Romans chapter 4, 1 through 12. Please turn there if you, if you have your Bibles. Romans chapter 4, 1 through 12. What we're going to see is that there's continuity and justification by faith. Paul, when he's trying to teach the gospel to the church, says, what about Abraham and David? And he illustrates the gospel that it's righteousness by faith, by grace through faith, apart from works. And he uses Abraham and he uses David to illustrate this. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's Genesis chapter 15. He believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So he says, justification by faith apart from works. Abraham. He supports it with David. Then he says, is the blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? Essentially what he's saying is, is Genesis 15 or Genesis 17 first? 15, he was declared righteous by God. 17, we're given circumcision. And Paul's saying, is it 15, then 17, or is it 17, then 15? I'm speaking, in a manner of speaking, you know. Which one is first? Is it justification by faith, or is it circumcision? That's what he's asking. He says, well, it was not after, but before he was circumcised. He was justified before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that, the right, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. A few things there. Father Abraham, he had many sons, right? Many sons had father Abraham, right? I'm one of them, so are you. So all praise the Lord. 
Do you want to do it? No, I'm, not, I'm not going to. Yeah. Um, but there's one people of God. Father Abraham, right? There's one pattern of salvation. Justification by faith apart from works. In other words, Paul is saying, if Genesis 17 is before 15, then we've got a problem. If circumcision is before justification, we've got a problem. But if justification is before circumcision, and it's a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith, then we have the gospel. It's much like the letters of Paul. When Paul writes to the Ephesians, he talks about how they're seated in the heavenly places. You have been saved by grace through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift from God, lest anyone should boast. But when he gets to chapter 4, what does he do? He says, now live a life worthy of the calling you've received. You see, it's the indicative. This is who you are in Christ Jesus. Then it's the imperative. Now live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Not the imperative, then the indicative. Not do this and live... But you have life in Christ Jesus. Now live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Genesis 15 is before Genesis 17, and that is the gospel. And that is the same pattern of covenant piety we see in the writings of Paul. In other words, when Paul describes the gospel to the church, he explains justification by faith apart from works by using both Abraham and David. While this one way of salvation is essentially the same, in other words, the ways in which this grace has been held forth to the people of God differs depending on their redemptive historical relationship to the death and resurrection of Christ. Are you worshiping Christ in anticipation of His coming or in light of His death and His resurrection? So this one way of, uh, of salvation is administered differently or held forth to the people of God differently depending on your relationship to the cross. Okay? So if you're looking forward to the coming of Christ, you're worshiping God in sacrifices and promises and types through priests and through the blood of bulls and goats and you have circumcision. If you're, however, looking back on the cross of Christ, you're this side of His accomplishment of our salvation, not anticipation of His accomplishment, but in light of His accomplishment then you worship Him differently in the preaching and proclamation of the Word. And no longer do you have an altar, you have a table, right? You don't come and sacrifice an animal when you go to church. I hope not. If, if so, we need to talk afterwards and I'll fly in and we'll try to help you find a better place. Instead, you have a table, right? Because there are no more blood sacrifices because Jesus Christ was offered up once for all. You've moved from shadow to reality. You've moved from darkness to light. Okay, So this one way of salvation is held forth to the people of God differently depending on their relationship to the cross. So the covenant of works is not the Old Testament and the covenant of grace the New Testament. Okay, The one covenant of grace as redemption in Christ is held forth in both the New and the Old Testaments. And I want to try to demonstrate that to you from Scripture. Okay, that's what we'll be doing uh, in the rest of this lecture. So I want to look at the one covenant of grace in diverse administrations. There are first the old covenant administrations of the covenant of grace. Now, there are some debates that I don't have time to get into tonight about where the Noahic covenant fits and where the Mosaic covenant fits. So for simplicity, we're going to talk uh, about, um, uh, about all of these various administrations under the, the, the rubric of the covenant of grace. Uh, I think of the, of the debates, the Noahic covenant is, from, to my mind, the most difficult with uh, fitting it within the covenant of grace because there are more universal implications. So the animals also will not be killed in this way. There's universal principles laid down, such as the death penalty and stuff like that, that is attached to the Noahic covenant um, that could make it a little bit... It leads to a debate about whether or not it actually belongs in the covenant of grace. I think that, from my view, the, the Mosaic covenant is more securely and more obviously belonging, in my view, to the covenant of grace. So with that caveat, let's talk about the Noahic covenant. And what I've done is, is I just want to give you a few passages to kind of wrap your mind around these various covenantal administrations, okay? Okay. 
So what I'm saying is, is these are covenantal administrations of the one covenant of grace. It's the difference between essence or substance and accidents. Substance refers to what a thing is in its essence, like what it actually is. So you have a ball. A ball is a ball, right? No matter what it looks like, at the end of the day, a ball is a ball, right? That's the substance. But there's a football, and there's a basketball, and there's a baseball, and there's a soccer ball. All of these are balls, but they look differently depending on their function, right? But at the end of the day, they're still balls. That's sort of the categories we're using when we're talking about covenant theology is, is that, in essence, all of these covenants belong to the covenant of grace that we're going to be covering. In essence, at their core, they are communicating salvation in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, at their core. But they are packaged differently or presented differently. That doesn't change the core of what they are. But it does present some, um, but they look differently, that grace is held forth differently throughout redemptive history, and that's what we'll be looking at a little bit. So the Noahic Covenant, Genesis 9, 9 and following, Behold, I will establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you. As many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all, all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So you see the more expansive, the covenant between God and every creature on the earth. And so that's why this one's more difficult to talk about within the covenant of grace, okay? But I think it's important for us to discuss here. Um, and then he says, God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit more about the rainbow, but I want to save that a little bit later, okay? We'll talk about rainbows in a few moments. Um, okay, the second major covenant is the Abrahamic covenant. Now, you can talk about the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12. That's an important passage. Genesis chapter 15 is important. There's the self-maledictory oath. God takes all of the obligations to fulfill the covenant upon himself in the cutting of the animals, and only God passes through them. That's a covenantal ceremony. Uh, you can sort of see that same kind of language appearing in Jeremiah chapter 34. So go back and read that. That's your homework for later. I'll be sending you a test virtually, um, so we'll have quizzes and stuff. It's going to be great fun. I'm excited. Um, and... Um, but go, go and read that, Jeremiah 34, and compare it to uh, the covenant, the cutting of the covenant, and the end of Genesis chapter 15. Uh, this is God taking all of the obligations upon himself. We call that the self-maledictory oath. God is taking a curse upon himself to fulfill the covenant. This is on the heels of justification by faith in Genesis chapter 15. Okay? Another important passage is Genesis 17 with the giving of circumcision and also the sacrifice of Isaac. But one passage, if I had to put you on one passage that summarizes the Abrahamic covenant, it would be Genesis 18, 17 through 19. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. Now bound up in that is kingship. He's gonna become a great and mighty nation. It's important to remember that the expansive part of this covenant, this covenantal promise. Sarah was barren. Abram was unable to have children with his wife, Sarah, and yet they're going to become a great nation. Okay, so there's this multiplication. You're going to want to remember that about the Abrahamic covenant, okay? And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. In your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's pointing forward to Jesus Christ. Abram, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. In your family shall all the families, in your seed, your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So all of the families of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children 
and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised to him. So all of this is going to be accomplished in the self-maledictory oath of Genesis chapter 15. Now the Mosaic Covenant. You remember the Mosaic Covenant is really an advancement of the Abrahamic Covenant. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Exodus chapter 2. God saw and God knew. Then he calls Moses, and it's time for God to bring his people out. In fact, the, the entire book of Exodus, you may not have known this, it actually begins with the word and, and an almost direct quote from the latter chapters of Genesis. It's just picking up on what's gone before. The, the book of Exodus begins with the word and. It's a continuation of what's gone before. And the Mosaic Covenant is a development. It's building upon what has gone forth in the Abrahamic Covenant. And uh, so one of the key passages for this, I'm not going to read all of Deuteronomy for you. I know that would be exciting for you, but, um, but uh, I do have to go home later. Um, it says, uh, we'll just start with Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words saying, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then he has the Ten Commandments. Now, if I were to ask you, how do you summarize the Ten Commandments? What would you say? What would you say? Well, you would say probably, hopefully, you would say, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Everything that you are, every fiber that you are belongs to God, and you should love him with that. And you shall love your neighbors yourself. When Jesus summarizes the law, that's what he says. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love. This is the first and great commandment. This is God saying to his people, this is how you love me. One God. One God. You shall not make images. Third commandment, you shall bear my name well. It's actually not just about blasphemy, by the way. It's not just about what you say out of your mouth. It's part of that. But it's actually, the Hebrew is better. It's God has placed his name upon you in the third commandment. And everywhere you go, you take the name of God with. And so bearing his name lightly is anything that you do with names, God's name placed upon you. In baptism, you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God has placed his name upon you. And everywhere you go, you take that name with you. Bearing his name lightly is not just, or, or honoring his name is not just about avoiding GD or OMG or something like that. It's, it's all of life, everywhere you go. He says, this is how you honor me. This is how you bear my name. I place my name upon you. And this is how you're supposed to honor it. You're supposed to honor it and honor me. And the fourth commandment about how you give of your time uh, to worship the Lord. Well, the next great commandment is like this. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Ten Commandments, I think, are rightly described by John Levinson as the love of God made practical. The law of God is the love of God made practical. What does it mean to love my neighbor? Well, I don't kill you. <laughs> it's part of it. But I also watch how my heart is with my anger. I, I protect your life. I don't steal from you, but I also protect what is yours. I care for what belongs to you. I don't covet what you have. This is what it means. Love of God and love of neighbor. And Paul even picks up on that in Romans chapter 13, where he says, Oh, no one anything but to love. And then he takes them through the Ten Commandments. And he says, this is what it means to love one another. So when looking at the reasons for given, uh, given for the exile in the Old Testament, they all relate to these two fundamental commandments. When you're reading through the northern kingdom's exile and the destruction of, of the northern kingdom in 722 B.C., or whether it's the southern kingdom in 586 B.C., both of them in the prophets are charged with idolatry, and both of them are charged with failing to love their neighbors. They are uh, robbing the poor. They are distorting justice. They're not loving their neighbors as themselves. They're not loving God, and they're not loving their neighbors. And so that'll be important to keep in mind as well as we continue to look at this one covenant of grace. 
Well, the Davidic covenant is an advancement of the Mosaic covenant. Deuteronomy chapter 17 tells you when you come into the land, you're going to ask for a king like the nations. You may have a king like the nations, and this is what your king is going to be like. He actually looks, he, he sits and he reads the word of God every day. He has to copy it, and the priests have to check it. That's what the king's like in Deuteronomy 17. He's much more like a professor, I think, you know, uh, than, than typical kings when we think of. So uh, he's a scholar, uh, rather. Uh, but he's under the word is the point, not over the word. And Psalm 89, 34 is a great passage to summarize uh, the Davidic covenant. He says, I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. Like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. So he says, David will never lack a man to sit upon the throne forever. So this is an advancement of the covenant of grace of the administration, of the Mosaic administration. And then finally, we have the New Covenant administration of the Covenant of Grace. Now, when you think of the New Covenant in the, in the Old Testament, you're probably thinking of Jeremiah 31, 31 and following, or Hebrews 8. Those are great passages to go to, uh, but I really want to focus on a different passage uh, tonight uh, because I think it really ties together these strands. So I've given you a lot of information, I know, but I want to tie these strands together using one New Covenant passage, Okay. And that's Isaiah 54 and 55, which is referred to as the eternal covenant of peace. Isaiah 54 and 55. So I'd encourage you to turn there. I want you to see that this new covenant is being held forth in continuity of the prior covenantal administrations. Okay? It's being held forth as fulfillment and in continuity with the prior covenantal administrations. Um, Isaiah 54 in verses 1 through 3, I want you to listen. I want you to hear for the Abrahamic covenant. Sing, O barren one. Who was barren? Sarah and Abram. Who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tents and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations. Remember, a national blessing and a national possession here, and will people the desolate cities. Isaiah 54 and 55 is addressing the people who are going to exile and talking about their redemption, talking about how God is going to redeem them. And he's echoing here the Abrahamic covenant in verses 1 through 3 with echoes such as enlarging the tents, possessing the nations, um, the, the joy of breaking forth, of having many children for the barren one. So the Sinai covenant, though, is picked up, or the Mosaic covenant, in 4 through 8. It's picked up in 4 through 8. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth. And the reproach of your widowhood, you will remember no more. Think about it for a moment, what God's promising here. Forgetting your shame. Probably everyone in this room has certain things that if you pop in your back of your mind, you go, oh, I can't, I can't believe I did that. And you feel this sense of shame. God is talking about a redemption here that is so full and so free that it's able to cover over your shame permanently. To the extent that it's described as being forgotten. And then it continues. You will remember it no more, for your maker is your husband. Where do you learn about your maker being your husband or your redeemer, right? That's the Mosaic covenant. God created Genesis. That's really the, the preamble to the Mosaic covenant in Exodus, is the whole declaration about God creating, right? Your maker is your husband. When talking about their infidelity to God, Hosea describes their relationship like an adulterous relationship. Israel's going after other gods, cheating on her spouse, right? He says, your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. God is creator. God is redeemer. It's clearly taught. In Genesis through Deuteronomy. The God of the whole earth, he is called. Verse 6. The Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit. Like a wife of youth, when she is cast off, says you are God. For a brief moment I deserted you. That's talking about the exile there. 
And remember, the Mosaic Covenant is really front and center when it's discussing the reasons for the exile. You didn't love God, you didn't love your neighbor. These two reasons, you're going into exile. Okay? And he says, For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face. Think of the ironic benediction, Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. Here he says, I'm hiding my face. It's a great judgment on the people of God. I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. You're to think of the exile, as bad as it was, and say that was God's overflowing anger for a moment. But he has loved me with an everlasting love. So it echoes and fulfills the Mosaic Covenant. Then the Noahic Covenant comes into view in the passage. Verse 9. Remember, this is a New Covenant passage here. And we're seeing these administrations of the covenant of grace being fulfilled in the one new covenant. They're all pointing forward to this reality. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. God will never be angry with you again? How is that even possible? For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. He says, it's like the days of Noah. Never again will I destroy the earth like this. He says, never again will I be angry with you. When you see a rainbow, what do you think of? Just think of a few things. First of all, the rainbow... Okay, I know it preaches really well, but it's wrong. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not right. Man, it'll preach, but it's not right. The idea that the bow is a warrior shooting up at God, like the sort of shooting God on, on the sky. Sorry, it's, it's not right. Uh, the imagery is actually rather different. It is a warrior's bow, but it's actually a symbol of peace when you hang up your bow. In the ancient Near East iconography, whenever you're at scenes of war, you're doing scenes of war, you have the bow pointing forward in the natural position at your enemies, Right? Whenever it's a sign of peace, the bow is inverted in so that the the bow of it is pointing at the person or it's pointed up because it symbolizes peace. You're not at war, you're at peace, so it's turned, it's inverted. So God says, I've hung up my bow in the sky. This is a symbol of peace. When you see the rainbow, then you should remember that God's made a promise and you're at peace with God. You should also remember that God is glorious. It's this, when the rainbow is used to describe the glory, the vision of the glory of God in Ezekiel. When Ezekiel has this, he's like the, the prophet of the 1960s, right? He's got like this crazy acid trip, right? I mean, that's what it kind of seems like. You read it, it's like, whoa, what's going on there? Um, I'm joking a little bit, but it is kind of weird, right? But it's, it's this vision of the glory of God. And he says, it's like the rainbow, that appe- it's like the bow that appears in the sky when the rain comes. And that rainbow appears again in Revelation chapter 4, describing the glory of Jesus Christ's throne, right? So when you think of the rainbow, think of the peace you have with God and think of the glory of God in Christ. And then I want you to think about the steadfastness of God, that it communicates the security with which you enjoy your salvation. Like He says, it's like the bow, it's like the days of Noah when I hung this up. So every time you see a rainbow, I want you to think about those things, Okay. I want you to think about the glory of God. I want you to think about the peace you have with God. I want you to think, remember that he has said in the new covenant, I will never, ever be angry with you again. Okay? Now, the Davidic covenant finally is introduced in 55 through 3 through through 4. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because... Of the Lord your God, and for he has has glorified you. And I jumped down too far. I went to four, not three. Sorry. Incline your ear. This is better. (laughs) Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. So it's all of this is fulfilled in the new covenant. The covenantal, prior covenantal administrations, Noahic, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, are all pointing forward to and fulfilled in the New Covenant. And it's clearly found in a New Covenant passage, Isaiah 54 and 55. But how is it that you can have an eternal covenant of peace with God where God can say, you will remember your sin no more and I will never ever be angry with you again? 
How is that possible? How do you get that sort of peace with God? Well, the eternal covenant of peace found in Isaiah 54 and 55 is achieved by the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us, there's your word, peace. With his stripes, we are healed. You get the eternal covenant of peace through the suffering servant of Isaiah 54, verse 5. And peace is not just the absence of conflict. Think of a peaceful house. It just means nobody's fighting, right? Peace in this context is actually referring to the full enjoyment of God's blessings. It's wholeness. Being whole and right with God. So, there is fundamental continuity in the covenant of grace. J.A. Packer describes them as unifying strands. There is one covenant promise, I will be your God and you'll be my people. One covenant mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. One pattern of salvation, justification by faith. One covenant people, you're all children of Abraham. And one pattern of covenant piety, you are made right with God, justification by grace through faith, in order that you might live a life worthy of the calling you've received. But there's also administrative diversity in the one covenant of grace. Uh, I've got a couple quotes from the larger catechism. I think it summarizes it really well. It should be obvious to you the connections. Old Testament, it's promises, prophecies, sacrifices, circumcision, the Passover, and other types and ordinances, which did all for signify Christ then to come, and were for that time sufficient to build up the elect in faith in the promised Messiah, by whom they had full remission of sin and eternal salvation. But under the new covenant, when Christ the substance was exhibited, the covenant of grace was and still to be administered in the preaching of the word, in the administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, in which grace and salvation are held forth in more fullness, evidence, and efficacy to all the nations. Fullness, evidence, efficacy for the nations. It's like the old covenant administration of the covenant of grace is like a flower. Voss described it like a flower. And in the new covenant with the coming of Christ, it's opened up. And now you can see the full beauty of what was always there. The lights have come on. The flower has opened up. And now you can see the fullness of what was pointed to in dark shadows, but now has more fully come and been realized in Jesus Christ. So, returning to our two covenants, there's the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. There are similarities and differences. In Vitzius, you can go read about this, but I'll just rifle through them really quickly. Same parties, God and man, same promises of eternal life, um, same condition, perfect obedience to the law, same end, the glory of God, but there are differences between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. In the covenant of works, you see God as the supreme lawgiver and inviting his, his creature into his goodness, into his happiness. But in the latter, you see God, in the covenant of grace, you see God as infinitely merciful, a judging life to the elect sinner, consistent with his wisdom and justice. In the covenant of grace, you have a mediator. In the covenant of works, you don't. You're on your own. In the covenant of works, man fulfills the conditions. In the covenant of grace, the mediator fulfills the condition on your behalf. In the covenant of works, it's works, life by works. In the covenant of grace, it's salvation by grace through faith. Romans 4, 4 through 5. In the covenant of works, the conditions lead to the blessing. Think about that for a moment. In the covenant of works, the conditions lead to the blessing. But in the, in the covenant of grace, the blessing leads to the obligations or conditions, whatever you want to call them. But the idea is, is that you have to do something in order to earn the blessing in the covenant of works. In the covenant of grace, you receive the blessing in order that you might live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Well, more could be said about that, but I want to conclude with this. Covenant theology teaches you how you are no longer under the law if you're in Christ Jesus. The law, you are not under the law as a covenant. Christ fulfilled the precept, bore the penalty, and won the reward. 
If you're in Christ Jesus, God himself could not keep the reward from you. Not that he ever would, but it's an impossibility. He won it for you. And there is no outstanding debt that you have before God if you're in Christ Jesus. None. There's not going to be a clerical error. There's not some new sin that you hide from everyone else. But when you get to glory, it's going to be found out. No, every jot, every tittle of the law fulfilled perfectly for you. Every penalty you deserved bore for you so that you might have the reward that Jesus Christ deserves, being brought into the family of God. But although you are set free from the condemning power of the law, you are no longer slaves to sin. For you have been bought with a price. Covenant theology teaches you how God not only saved you from your sin, but how you are being made more and more into his likeness. Romans 8, 1 through 4 says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let that sink in for just a moment. No condemnation. Next time you yell at your kids or blow your top or start gossiping, or whatever it is you struggle with, I'm sure you're all lovely, but you're going to teach people who struggle with sin, right? I know you don't, but you're going to teach people who struggle with sin, and so you need to think about applications. But remember that there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. You don't have to earn your favor back with God, even when you sin. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, what's the problem with the, wall, with the law? Weakened by the sinful flesh could not do. God has done what the law could not do, weakened by the flesh. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemns sin in the flesh, and now listen to this, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God is doing this work in you so that you might walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God is doing something in you. There is an expiration date on your sin, but not on your salvation. And one day, one day you will become finally what Jesus Christ died to make you. You are being conformed more and more into His image. And one day, that will be a reality. And you will worship God and enjoy the tree of life without a divided heart, without pattern sin, and you will remember your shame no more because God said, I will never, ever, ever be angry with you again. That is why we study covenant theology. And that is the shape of redemptive history. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the redemption we have in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the hope, and we thank you that all the promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And so we pray that we would be assured by you and of your goodness, in whose name we pray.